Steve Balch, and I run something called, you probably have the, the brochure there, the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. We do a lot of things, but one of the things that we do year after year uh, is help uh, produce the extravaganza. We've done that now for four consecutive years. We generally bring in speakers, sometimes Texas Tech faculty, sometimes faculty from a distance. We had one other speaker. I'm bravely kind of coming forward to try my hand at this lecture business, whatever it is, uh, myself. But if you were uh, in the lecture on the Middle East that Professor Hodes gave, uh, he was also brought to you um, by the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. So, the Great War, we don't call it that anymore. Nowadays, pretty, pretty much people say World War I or the First World War or something like that. But in its time and uh, in the years up to the Second World War, it was called the Great War. Uh, because like no war, certainly during the hundred years preceding, and perhaps during all of European history, no war had so changed things as did the Great War. Um, and I think we can still say that today. The Great War created the 20th century. Uh, virtually everything at the political level and at other levels too that occurred in the 20th century were the result of this war, including the Second World War, which almost certainly would not have happened as it did and perhaps wouldn't have happened at all had the First World War, the Great War, not occurred. Um, the Great War also is ultimately the cause of the Cold War, with which many of the people in this class uh, lived uh, a good portion of their lifetimes <laughs> through. So the Great War deserves its name, even if that's no longer what we call it. Um, unlike World War II, uh, the Great War was fought in a more restrictive geographical theater. Uh, the greatest part of it by far was fought in Europe and in the Atlantic approaches to Europe, the naval part of the war. There was a fair amount of fighting in the Middle East, in the territories of the Ottoman Empire, and in Turkey itself, the Gallipoli Campaign. There was some fighting in Africa, um, largely by African troops led by European soldiers. Uh, but there was virtually no fighting uh, in Asia to speak of, though Asian troops participated, particularly from India and from Southeast Asia for the French and from India for the British. So it wasn't a war that had the geographical extent of the Second World War. And in fact, uh, if you look back into the 18th century, and some people think it should be called the First World War, the Seven Years' War, fought from 1756 to 1763, was actually fought more geographically in a more geographically extended space in India, in the Americas, and in Europe than was the Great War. Nonetheless, uh, the Great War had a tremendous impact, all the ones that I've mentioned, plus psychological impact as well, where, as you probably know, uh, in the uh, centennial year of the end of the Great War, it ended in 1918, and so this is the 100th anniversary. Uh, Armistice Day, it used to be called Armistice Day, and now it's Veterans Day, November, traditionally November 11th, but now the closest Monday <laughs> to November 11th. Since we don't commemorate specific events anymore, we just like to have long weekends. <laughs> Uh, originally was uh, the day of the, the actual end of the war, the day the guns fell silent, as they used to rather dramatically say. Uh, the armistice occurred on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. It wasn't in 1911, of course, but it was 1918, but for the rest of it was, uh, was all 11. This is a rather iconic photograph. It shows British troops in the trenches. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly when. It's not the beginning of the war because they're already wearing helmets, which they didn't during the war's first year. But it kind of it was used by the BBC when they did a 13-part uh, uh, history of the war 25 years ago to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the war's end. It does show you the kind of grimness, uh, the dirty, 
um, brutal, almost animal-like quality of the lives led by the soldiers who fought in the trenches on the Western Front. If they were fighting elsewhere, the circumstances were somewhat different. In the Middle East, it was out in the open. Uh, in Africa, it was also out in the open. So let's see if this works. So, when the war began, the world was very different from what the world would be afterward, uh, and certainly very different from what the world is today, and, and these changes were produced by the, by the war. Um, first off, uh, we hear the term Eurocentrism, Eurocentric. The world was very Eurocentric back then, which is to say that except for the United States, which was rapidly rising, and Japan, which was beginning to rise, all the political powers that counted for anything were in Europe. Europe was the scene of great power conflict. Almost all of Africa and a great deal of Asia, particularly India and Southeast Asia, were under European control. European empires extended throughout the old world, certainly, the new world in freedom. And for the most part, though, Canada was still <coughs> not quite an independent state, still, still part of the British Empire. Europe was also at its peak in terms of population. Uh, it wasn't, as we'll see in a moment, the most populous place in the world, but relatively speaking, it had more people then than it, would, than it has today. I mean, if, if, when you see the map, you'll see how those changes occurred. So the Industrial Revolution had occurred in Europe. This had allowed for a big increase in population because it had produced a lot more goods, a lot more food, a lot more medical care, stuff like that. The population was growing. Uh, had not yet really started to grow that much elsewhere. Europe had more of the world's wealth, and finally, uh, Europe was divided politically into two major competing alliance systems. There were the so-called central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and not very reliably, but nominally part of the central power scheme, Italy. Uh, those were all kingdoms, all monarchies. And they were arrayed against a dual alliance of France and Russia, and with the inclusion of England, which sort of tilted toward France and had taken, uh, made some secret agreements, basically, to uh, come to France's support in various ways, uh, you had what was known as the Triple Entente. That is to say, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom. So those were the two power blocks. And there you see the map of Europe then. Much simpler map. We have so many more countries today. Someone once said that the major thing the First World War did, and we'll be especially interested in this from the perspective of being school teachers, the major thing that the First World War did was create more geography. Because rather than just having a few countries, you then had a whole lot. Made it harder to be, it was made it harder to get into geography. <laughs> I'm sure for many students that's, that's the worst consequence that, that, that it had. But there you see what uh, um, Europe looked like then. The Russian Empire extended into what is now Poland, um, this composite state, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which not only had Austrians and Hungarians, but Czechs and Slovaks and Croats and Serbs and Romanians, um, a kind of big patchwork state. Uh, Italy had been re re recently, in 1861, reunified uh, the German Empire in 1871. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the, the United Kingdom still included all of Ireland back then. And here are the empires. Um, the sun never sets on the British Empire, was the way the story went. There was not a time zone in the world in which you couldn't find some British-controlled territory. And again, Australia and New Zealand and Canada were not yet fully independent. They were self-governing, uh, but as far as foreign policy was concerned, they were still under the British crown. Um, and so when Britain went to war, they went to war too. Uh, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire was India, that big pink area on the south end of uh, 
of Asia, and uh, the British almost controlled a corridor from Egypt down to South Africa. So the British Empire was very, very extensive. French Empire was somewhat smaller. Basically, it was North Africa, a large part of West, and some of Central Africa, uh, and Southeast Asia, what we now say is uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And then there was a smaller Dutch Empire in Indonesia. Uh, there were some German states, which had, as a result of the scramble for Africa at the end of the 19th century, uh, been acquired by uh, the German Empire, and there was the Belgian Congo. So here you can see the population contrast before the war. So this is world population, relatively speaking. The bigger countries have a, have a relatively larger share of the total population of the world than the smaller countries. That's how things look in 1900, and this is pretty much how things look today. So first take a look at Europe today, and then see how much more Europe contained then. And take a look at Africa. There's been a tremendous change. Africa, pretty small and underpopulated. Africa, red. The Americans, pretty small, much larger today. Uh, and there have been changes elsewhere to India and China, are more populous than they once were. And this is um, what I said, mentioned earlier. This is a graphic representation of the distribution of wealth. Uh, if you go back, for example, to 1500, um, this is Europe compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world is now here, at least not all of the rest of the world. India, Japan, and China are now here. Uh, but if you look at 1900, Europe is all of this, and India and China, Japan is growing. In China are pretty small. So that's the result of the Industrial Revolution, the tremendous enrichment that occurred in Europe as a result. If you look at the later years, you see that the rest of the world has been coming up. And again, the alliance systems, as I mentioned. So the period that preceded the outbreak of the war were halcyon days. They were among the calmest, most prosperous, most inventive time in the whole history of the Western world and of Europe. A long period of peace after, between 1871, the end of the Franco-Prussian War, and 1914, no major wars involving more than a single great power. None of the great powers were fighting each other during that time. There were wars in the Balkans, uh, some wars involving uh, Russia and Turkey, but um, not involving the big European states. Um, the Industrial Revolution was spreading rapidly, and all sorts of products that we now take for granted that make life so much easier were not only coming into existence, but were affordable, not only for middle class people, but for a growing number of uh, even working class people in more prosperous countries. Bicycles, for example, are late 19th century invention. Telephones, of course, it took a while for most people to get telephones, but they're, they're coming on the scene. Um, typewriters, sewing machines, electric lights, and at the very, toward the end of the period, automobiles and airplanes. Some people aren't buying them, but they're, they, are, they, are, they are there. So a lot of what we now call consumer durables, that is to say, you know, when you're very, very poor and you're a peasant, uh, most of the things you get you consume rapidly, or they wear out. Food, for example, or clothing doesn't last very long. But consumer durables are things that once you purchase them, and particularly if you get a warranty, uh, they can be with you for some time, and they're very useful. They're machines you can take home. So that's coming on the scene during this period. Uh, the earlier part of the 19th century, the part that was right after the French Revolution, the next 30 or 40 years, had been a period of a lot of unrest. Revolutions in 1830 and 1848, waves of revolution, sort of like the Arab Spring, uh, but in Europe, uh, were occurring all the time. Um, regimes were tottering. Uh, no one felt safe on their throne, if they happened to have a throne. Um, but that 
begins to die down in the latter part of the century. And it's partly due to states becoming better organized, having better police forces, uh, better ways of surveilling uh, revolutionaries. Um, it's also a, a question of the prosperity and the fact that a lot of the left-wing political parties uh, in Europe are beginning to accept democracy. Um, in Germany, in, in France, in England, uh, when you have uh, social democratic and labor parties developing, uh, they think they can make, now they begin to think they can make their revolutions, they can change society through the ballot box rather than going out and overthrowing the government. So things are calming down. The one exception to this, well, there are two exceptions. One exception is Russia, uh, which has a lot of revolutionary movements and is holding on to its autocracy. The czar is not giving any ground with respect to bringing people into the government until 1905, when they, when they are forced to make some concessions. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which has a problem with minorities, uh, various groups that want to break away and set up their own states. And so there are assassinations and terrorism in Austria and assassinations and terrorism uh, in Russia. It's also a very rich period as far as culture is concerned. Opera, you know, symphonic music, and painting, all sorts of new modes of, of, of painting, uh, expressionism, impressionism, pointillism. Cubism, all sorts of things are shaking up uh, accepted ways of doing stuff. So it's a very fertile period, and it's an optimistic period. It's a period in which people not only believe in progress, they've been believing in progress since the Enlightenment, at least intellectuals have, they can now see it right in front of their eyes and see it not only as something that is experienced by the very rich, but is experienced by everybody. People are able to also move large distances. There are railroad networks everywhere. There are steamships crossing the Atlantic, bringing millions of people to the United States and, and other um, countries in the Americas. So that's changing as well. So that's La Belle Epoque, the, the beautiful period. And here's uh, this rather famous painting by Renoir, which sort of gives you a sense of, of the sort of uh, color and would say for volume, people having good times, people enjoying themselves, affording, being able to afford enjoy, in, in enjoyment uh, in a way that ordinary people haven't been able to do in the past. And yet, there are problems. Um, and one of the big problems is that it's becoming harder and harder to predict in Europe what's going to happen politically because the map of Europe has been changing. New states are appearing, Germany is united. Italy is united. And not only that, but the Industrial Revolution is making some states move forward in terms of wealth and power much more quickly than others. So Germany not only unites in 1871, but it also industrializes very quickly thereafter. Uh, and it's bearing down upon the leading country at the time, which was the United Kingdom uh, in 1914. It, it almost surpassed. It was bigger in size and population. Uh, and it almost had surpassed Britain uh, in wealth. Russia was poor, but Russia was developing too, and its population was increasing very, very rapidly. Um, we think you know, that Russia somehow was brought into modernity by the communists, but that's not true. Uh, the last 20 or 30 years of the Tsarist regime were years of very rapid economic improvement. Um, not, not rapid enough, I suppose, to, to give the regime the stability that, that the Tsar would have liked to have had. But the Germans were very worried about what this colossus would be once it had uh, achieved the same level of industrial might as the Germans, because it was far bigger, bigger in territory uh, and bigger in population. You can see how population has increased uh, between, 18, between 1860 and 1913, it increased 120% in Russia. Uh, and uh, along with this went a railroad system that was being built toward the German border, which meant that if war came, the Russians would be able to take the great masses of population, uh, bring them into the army, and move them toward Germany. What would happen then to the Germans? So other countries were also growing, but not nearly as fast. Um, the uh, scramble for Africa, as it's sometimes called, which occurred during this period, Africa had stayed outside 
um, imperial control for the most part until about 1870. Uh, Southern Africa was colonized before then, to be sure. Northern Africa, the part of the long Mediterranean seaboard, was also colonized for the most part before then. But uh, tropical Africa, in between, uh, was not um, for a variety of reasons, one of which was that Europeans could not stay healthy uh, in the tropics. There were all sorts of diseases. It's sort of like when um, Europeans arrived in the New World. They brought with them diseases that the populations there had no immunity to. Uh, and in Africa, you had things like malaria and yellow fever. Uh, the people who lived there had more immunities than Europeans did. Uh, and so the death rate for Europeans going down there was very great. In 1870 uh, and thereafter, um, uh, the development, you, you had the development of quinine, the use of quinine as a medicine. Uh, and that, in part, allows for the expanse, the expansion of empire into Africa because it makes it easier to resist malaria. Uh, and so around uh, 1870 and then going forward, Africa is carved up among the various European states. And this actually increases tension because they're all trying to get their share before the other guys get there. It's a, a kind of nationalistic uh, competition. Um, it turned out that most of the African colonies, with the exception of South Africa and the Congo, didn't pay. They didn't really bring to the European powers a big return on the investment that it took to conquer them. But they, every European power wanted to have a colony, or several if they could, uh, in Africa. Um, democracy was also making things less secure. Uh, if you had to cope with a democratic electorate, we couldn't carry on politics and diplomacy as it once had been. Uh, it used to be a club, a small group of aristocrats from various countries. They needed something like the Congress of Vienna, uh, and they'd come to uh, they make deals with each other. But if you have an electorate at home, you may be tossed out of office. It's not so easy to make those deals. So that was a problem, uh, at least as far as diplomacy and, and, and dealing with crises and conflicts is concerned. And finally, um, in the period right before the war, the first decade or so, uh, decade and a half of the 20th century, uh, you had people on various important thrones who weren't up to the job. You had a Russian czar who was uh, intellectually mediocre and weak willed. You had a German Kaiser who was vain, narcissistic, mercurial, um, uh, arrogant. Uh, and you had in Austria an aged uh, emperor uh, whose powers, as he moved into his 80s, which was a good deal older than nowadays, of course, so 80s is nothing, 70s is young. <laughs> but in those days, 80s was, was very old, uh, and he was kind of losing his grip. Um, when he, uh, it's a, a, a example of uh, his mind not being quite in the right place. Um, when he heard, this is Franz Josef, when he heard that the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, his nephew, an heir to the throne, uh, had been assassinated, uh, apparently the first thing he said is, I knew what was going to happen, serves him right, he shouldn't have married that woman. Uh, and uh, the, the, what, what happened was that uh, uh, Franz Ferdinand had made a love marriage. He hadn't married somebody of imperial rank. He had married a mere countess, and being a countess didn't count for very much. Uh, and um, uh, that was the first thing that Franz Josef thought of um, when he heard about the assassination. So um, Austria was uh, probably not all that well governed. It was difficult to govern in any event with its Austrian side and its Hungarian side. Uh, the commander of its armies, Conrad von Hotzendorf, reputedly was eager to go to war because he wanted to impress the woman, a married woman, with whom he was having an affair. He wanted her to leave her husband, and he thought that if he turned into a great war hero, uh, she might do that. I don't know whether that happened or not. He didn't turn into a great war hero, no, as it turned out for him. So, bad things. Uh, the July crisis was the period between the assassination uh, and, and August 4th, when Britain, the last of the uh, major powers, entered, entered the war, they declared war on each other gradually. It was a succession. 
of, of declarations. Um, first off, the war did not come about by design. And, and this makes the First World War, the Great War, different from the Second World War. The Second World War was the result of a plan of aggression that Hitler was carrying out knowledgeably and with full forethought. Uh, Hitler probably hoped that the Western powers would not confront him. He was certainly very happy had they not done that. But he knew well that there was a risk of European war, and he was willing to take it. Um, and of course, he didn't have to invade Russia. He did that, too, by design, to carry out this far-flung plan of German expansion and, and colonization. But that wasn't the way in which the Great War, the First World War, began. Uh, all the people, whatever their shortcomings were, who were in control of affairs, were by and large civilized people. They did not want to have a vast bloodbath. They did not want to have an all-out pan-European war. Um, they found themselves trapped by a series of decisions made on the basis of incomplete information uh, and on the basis of miscalculations as to what others would do. And by the time they realized what was happening, they were too committed in terms of their prestige to turn back. So this was a war that was entered upon by a series of blunders. Um, and that's important uh, not only because it shows you how Europe had sunk by the Second World War, where it was a war by design, but also because after the war was over, uh, there was a conscious effort to try to create institutions that would prevent those sorts of blunders from occurring again, or at least minimize the likelihood. The uh, League of Nations and then the United Nations, which is sort of the successor of the League of Nations. There were also a problem, and this is something that military uh, thinkers have, have tried to have learned something from and have tried to rectify. Uh, they had very rigid all the great powers, certainly Germany and, and, and Russia, had very rigid plans for how they would conduct a war if a war was going to come. Uh, and these plans were the result of largely two new things that had occurred in the world of warfare. One was mass armies, in which when you fought a war, you were going to have millions of people under arms, you are going to draft them, you are going to send them to various embarkation points, you are going to give them what they needed to fight, you are going to send them off to the front, you are going to, in a very short period of time, it had to be a very short period of time, because you were racing against your enemies who were trying to do the same thing. Uh, you are going to have to do all these things. And it was possible to do this for the first time, too, because of new communication and transportation technology, because of telegraphs, uh, everybody could know what was going on on a broad scale, and because of railroads, and a lot of railroad systems uh, had been built hardly prior to the uh, war with thinking about the possibility of a fight. But the problem was, uh, when it became so complicated to mobilize and move armies to various military fronts, uh, once you started, you could not stop. And once you started to make a certain set of decisions, you could not unmake them easily and do something else. And so, for example, when the Russians started to mobilize, the Tsar initially wanted to follow a plan whereby the mobilization would be confined to Russia's border with Austria-Hungary, because that was the country he was most worried about. That was bearing down on Russia's ally, Serbia, which had carried out, more or less carried out, the assassination of the Archduke. But when he talked to his generals, while they told him he could do that, they also told him that if it was then necessary also to mobilize against Germany, they could not you know, swing things around. Uh, all, the, all the troops, all the train tracks, all the assignment of, 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 of trains to, to the south could not easily be done, be redone and, 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 and sent to the west. 
uh, if you were to commit yourself to a mobilization against Austria, you could not very easily then mobilize against Germany as well. So what they told him he had to do was to mobilize against both at the same time. They did have a plan for that. So they couldn't switch from one plan to another. They couldn't refine what it was they were trying to do because the mobilization schedules, the train schedules, and loading and unloading was simply too complicated for them to change their mind once the die had been cast. Uh, the Germans had a similar problem. The German uh, strategy, uh, the Germans anticipated having to fight a two-front war against Russia and France because they were allies. Um, if it was going to fight Russia, you're going to fight France as well. They didn't want to have to fight a two-front war, so they came up with the idea of sending most of their troops to the west against France, going through Belgium, this was known as the von Schleifen plan, defeating the French within a month, and then before the Russians could really get started, they assumed the Russians would mobilize slowly because of the vast territories of Russia. Move everybody back to the east and then defeat the Russians. So first you defeat the French, then you defeat the Russians. There's a point just before the war begins where the Kaiser thinks maybe the French aren't going to come in and fight. Maybe they're not going to uphold their treaty. Maybe they'll stay neutral. Uh, he's led to believe that by some miscommunications that occurred. Uh, and he asks his generals whether they can only fight against the Russians. And he's told no. Uh, we're not set up to do that. We've worked all this out in advance. It's very complicated. We can change our minds. So the leaders find themselves trapped uh, by technology and complicated war planning uh, that rather than being under their control gets control of them. Uh, finally, there's a kind of aristocratic honor mentality that will not survive the war. Um, many of the countries, particularly uh, in the East, Germany, Russia, Austria, uh, were aristocratic. They were still dominated by aristocracies. And aristocracies in European history are military in nature um, and have very strong notions of valor and courage and um, uh, upholding the kind of personal honor as well as the honor of the state itself. It's less going to be less true in Britain, although certainly it's an aristocracy there, and, and in France, which is a republic. But just to illustrate that, I've gotten some pictures of, of these aristocratic generals uh, in full getup. Um, and you can just see the way they look. You can't really imagine military men, even though they still you know, wear decorations, uh, looking, the posing that way, let alone dressing that way. I, I love that guy's hat there at the end. Uh, that's uh, Field Marshal von Mackesen, a uh, German uh, officer. Um, the, the, this proud looking fellow uh, is General Renenkamp, who's Russian despite his German sounding name. Uh, that's General Mischek, he's the, uh, the commander of the Serb forces, which, could, which uh, actually acquitted themselves rather well. Uh, and that's uh, Armando Diaz, who was the final commander at the very end of the war of Italian. Forces, and they all kind of look alike. So that's the Schleifen plan, by the way, probably the most famous military plan in history, in which you try to go around the French forces, which were presumably going to mobilize, and, and they did, along the German border. You go all the way around them through Belgium. Problem with going through Belgium is Britain had a treaty with Belgium guaranteeing its neutrality. And that really decides the British. They have to debate it. It wasn't uh, an absolutely clear cut decision. That decides the British on, on going to war. Uh, the Italians, um, even though they were expected to join, at least nominally, should have joined the Germans and the Austrians, welched at the last moment. Uh, probably due in part to the fact that their military commander, who was ready to go, died of a heart attack two days before the war began. Uh, and the Italian government then reconsidered what their plans were. So, it was great carnage. It was a tremendous bloodbath. Uh, like nothing seen ever, I would say, though of course the Napoleonic Wars uh, were pretty sanguinary. Um, but uh, this was a period of mass conscription. So quite ordinary people, without volunteering, could find themselves drawn into uh, the general butchery. Uh, the United Kingdom, for example, even during the Napoleon, 
hadn't had conscription. But in 1916, uh, two years into the war, they're forced into it. Of course, that happens in the United States as well. So the, the, the amount of casualties was staggering. Um, those are the first column uh, are the total number of deaths, military deaths. The second column uh, is the total number uh, of people in the country. And the last column uh, is the total number of civilian deaths. And you can, the civilian deaths were mainly, this was not like the Second World War, where there were tremendous atrocities, except in Turkey, uh, where the Armenians were subject to massacre. Um, and this was, uh, civilian deaths in this war were mainly due to famine and to uh, sickness, but as a result of the deprivations in the war. And then at the very end of the war, you probably know that, and this was also brought on by the weakening of populations due to the stress the war placed on them. The, the tremendous Spanish flu epidemic, which killed 5% of the world's population in two years, including my grandma. So, um, fortunately, it was after she had my father. <laughs> <laughs> there have been many, many World War I events affected my life, I'll tell you before that. And some of the battles were very, very, very costly. Somme, Verdun, Rusloff Offensive, uh, really tremendous amounts of, of bloodshed. And the opening and closing phases were also immensely bloody, because during those periods, the troops weren't in the trenches. They were out in the open and moving. And it was that time when they were most at risk. We think of the trenches as being terribly unsafe, but actually you were pretty safe in the trenches. It was when they met, made you get out of the trenches. Uh, that you were that you were in trouble. Um, so, just in the Somme alone, it's the worst day in the history of British arms. Uh, Twenty thousand people. That's what five times as many who died as many who died in 9/11. Uh, uh, five times as many in a single day uh, of fighting. And of course, the overall casualties uh, were were appalling. And while the Somme was going on, Verdun was going on, that was mainly a French affair, and the ca casualties were equally staggering. So, let's now look at the legacy uh, of this great trauma uh, in, the here, in the history of the world, and of the Western world in particular. Uh, what were the consequences of the war? Of course, initially, uh, the victorious powers got together and dictated a peace, imposed it on the defeated countries uh, and signed a treaty June 28th, it was the fifth anniversary of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, uh, signed a treaty uh, at the Palace of Versailles in France. And there you see the kind of leading statement, including the American representative, can anybody identify him? Woodrow Wilson was holding a paper in his hands, uh, perhaps because in some ways uh, he was an architect of much of what went into the treaty. What did the treaty do? And here you see the modern world beginning to emerge. First thing the treaty did was affirm, and this again came out of, it wasn't something that uh, the British and the French particularly wanted, they were imperial powers. It really came mainly from the mind and pen of Woodrow Wilson, the 14 points, the principle of self-determination for nationalities. That is to say, uh, if you had a group of people, they should have a state. This was only really applied to Europe um, in the immediate aftermath of the treaty. And so all kinds of new states were formed out of old empires. Poland, for example, had been part of Russia. It now became an independent state. So too, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, and Finland, became independent states. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had collapsed at the very end of the war, so there was now Austria and Hungary, but there was also the new state of Yugoslavia, made up of Serbia and the surrounding Slavic areas. In addition, there was Czechoslovakia, that had been part of Austria, Hungary, uh, and other um, states like <coughs> Romania took territories from what had been Austria, Hungary, that had Romanian populations in them. So there are all these new states. In addition, even though 
there was nothing in the treaty that required the <coughs> victorious powers to give up their empires. There were new territories taken from the Ottoman Turks and from the Germans, and the question was what to do with them. And they weren't simply gobbled up into the imperial empires of the victors. Rather, they were called not colonies, but mandates. In other words, the idea was that if you were going to rule a foreign territory, that was a mandate. You weren't ruling it in perpetuity. You were ruling it for the sake of the people you were ruling, not for yourself. And eventually, you were supposed to look forward to the time when you could give it independence. So you had this new concept, again, growing out of the 14 points, even applying to some degree outside of Europe, that there should be self-rule for all peoples. Now, of course, there are many more peoples in the world that even today have self-rule. This was a tricky concept. Uh, right now, you know, if you look at a country like Afghanistan, uh, it's made up of five or six different eth ethnicities, each of which could conceivably have its own state. Uh, if you look at a place like Nigeria, the same thing is true. If you look at India, the same thing is true. Um, there, are there are nationalities that are too dispersed to easily give them their own states, or that existing states don't want to allow to gain independence. The Kurds, for example, are, 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 are such a people, now divided between the Iranians, the Turks, uh, and the Iraqis, and the Syrians. They're, they're in all those countries. They're in Syria, they're in Iraq. They could have a state. The territories they occupy are fairly contiguous, but the self-determination of other peoples has presented, prevented them from getting self-determination. In addition to that, uh, very severe restrictions were placed on Germany. They have to pay a lot of money in fines, so to speak. They call them reparations. Uh, all of the uh, costs of the war, supposedly, since they were to blame, and the war guilt clause, which was stuck in to the Treaty of Versailles, made the Germans, and the Germans resented this immensely. They didn't think they were totally to blame, and they weren't. But it said, you're to blame, and you and your former allies have to pay off the, cause, the costs of the, of the war. Um, Germany also lost some territory uh, in the east to, uh, to Poland. Um, and the League of Nations, which is the model for the sort of uh, predecessor of, but the same kind of organization, the model for the United Nations, also comes into existence. This is what Woodrow Wilson most wanted. Uh, and he sacrificed a number of other things in order to get the League. And of course, the great irony was the United States who refused to enter uh, the League of Nations. He was stymied by the Senate's refusal to approve in the form he wanted um, a uh, entry in, membership in, the, in the League. The League of Nations itself, as I said, a model for the United Nations, condemned external aggression. So you have here definitively the judgment that you're not supposed to go to war <coughs> simply because there's something you can gain from that war. That's not a good enough reason. Um, Any time there's external aggression, all the other countries are supposedly, according to the Covenant of the League of Nations, to unite against the aggressor. So this is a very new notion, a change in the view that people have about war. Uh, the League of Nations, the Charter provided for mediation and arbitration when there were disputes that couldn't be resolved between the parties themselves. It created, and it still exists, a permanent international court of justice, also an international council on labor to deal with what we now call sort of humanitarian and human and sort of civil rights, uh, social welfare type issue, issues. Um, uh, so it, it, it put in place a good deal of the apparatus of international conflict resolution that we now have. And even though the League itself uh, was destroyed or at least it didn't survive as an entity, the Second World War. Uh, it had an immediate successor which was drawn up on very similar lines. The Japanese wanted to have in the Charter a statement affirming racial equality, um, but the United States, Woodrow Wilson in particular, who was a Southerner, you may remember, uh, and who saw the consequences for the United States of affirming that kind of policy of segregation. Uh, killed it. 
There also, after uh, the end of the Great War, comes, it, it, it had existed before, it, it wasn't totally born uh, after the war, but it is energized after the war, an international peace movement. Um, peace organizations of all sorts. None of them still exist, but they all, again, have uh, descendants that exist today. The War Resisters International, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the No More War Movement, the Peace Pledge Union, all came into existence. Uh, there was a move for disarmament, and also uh, a hunt for the folks who supposedly brought the war on, the merchants of death. It was thought in many places that the war had been instigated by people who owned munitions industries, people who made weapons. They had paid off politicians. It doesn't stand up to historical inspection. But it was widely believed. Uh, and there is a disarmament movement that is launched. In 1922, uh, the leaders of the great powers uh, meet in Washington, sign the Washington Naval Treaty which limits the size of navies. It requires a lot of countries to sink the ships they already had, or at least retire them. Uh, so that was sort of new. And uh, you have all these with popular media carrying them. I don't know if you've ever seen All Quiet on the Western Front, the movie. Have you seen that? So uh, the interesting thing about that movie, which was based on a German novel written right after the war, Eric Remarque, so All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, is that you know it depicts German soldiers. It's all about these German soldiers in the First World War. The people who only 12 years before the movie appeared had been killing Americans and French and British, and yet the, the movie's a tremendous success. Uh, people go and watch it, they sympathize. Um, there's really been a kind of revolution in, in attitudes about war and, and even about sort of what we might call sort of global brotherhood uh, is, is coming into existence. Uh, and the war, which was supported in its time, uh, the people who actually fought the war, while they were fought, fighting it, almost uniformly thought it was a good thing, that they were doing the right thing. And this attitude persists a few years after the war is over. But by the late 1920s and 1930s, there's a huge turn of uh, a thought that the war was totally unnecessary, <coughs> that it was brought on by blundering statesmen and fought by blundering generals. And, was, was a terrible thing. This actually persists well into my lifetime. Um, the view that you know the people who fought the war were military incompetents who had, had no real concern for the uh, the men that they were sacrificing. Have any of you ever seen another World War One movie called Paths of Glory? It's a Stanley Kubrick film. Well, that captures uh, what people concluded about the war, about the generals who fought the war. Um, so, uh, that's a big change, too. It's not viewed as a heroic enterprise, less so in the United States. You know, the United States didn't see it quite as darkly as, say, in Britain and, and France. Um, on the other hand, in the defeated powers, particularly in Germany, uh, the reaction is different. Here, the belief grows up that the war should have been won and could have been won but that Germany was betrayed, that uh, in 1918 it, it loses because of a stab in the back, a uh, stab in the back by um, bourgeois politicians and Jews and people like that. Um, the notion in Germany is that we weren't nationalist enough, uh, that we have to be stronger in the future and that our time of revenge will come and sort of this grows up alongside the other attitude. Both, both attitudes in Germany exist side by side for a while uh, under the Weimar Republic. But while the other countries, ironically, the victor countries, are becoming less nationalistic and are becoming less confident uh, of, of themselves and, and of their right to make war, uh, the Germans are moving in the other direction. Equally important, however, is that the, bower, the balance of power changes in a way that, despite the intentions of the victorious allies of the Treaty of Versailles, actually puts Germany in a position of greater potential power. And the reason for that is that the events of the war create a power vacuum on the east of Germany. Uh, the Germans, if you recall, in 1914, were worried about having to fight on two fronts simultaneously. 
against the French and the Russians. But with the war over, Russia has <coughs> disappeared, at least as it had been. Uh, it is now the Soviet Union. It is now a good deal smaller. Uh, between the Soviet Union and Germany is the new state of Poland and these small states up here, uh, the um, state of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, those are weak, and Soviet Union is a kind of pariah state with which no one else really wants to deal. And rather than having an Austro-Hungarian empire, again, you have a number of small states, Hungary, Austria, Czechoslovakia, um, Yugoslavia, and, and Romania. So the problem, you might say, the geostrategic problem for Germany uh, has, in a way, been eased. Um, there is a vacuum to the east, and Hitler, of course, will exploit this. So, uh, you've heard of the term black swan event. The black swan event is a very unlikely event. There aren't many black swans around. Have any of you ever seen a black swan? You've seen a black swan. They're in Australia. Yeah. You can see black swans in Australia. <laughs> so, a black swan is an unusual event. Lots of things that would have had very little chance of occurring occur because of the Great War, because of World War I. And these things, again, are going to mark the next hundred years or so uh, of European history. For one thing, Russia falls under the control of a revolutionary <coughs> sect, of a very small group of people, probably at the time of the revolution not more than 10 or 15,000, the Bolshevik party led by Lenin and several others. Um, and uh, this is a group that has nothing to do, that has morally and intellectually severed its connections with the rest of Western civilization. It's part of it in some sense. Utopian movements have been part of Western civilization. Uh, but it is opposed in a kind of fundamentally profound way to the rest of the West. It's anti-Christian at a time when Europe is still uh, pretty much unanimously Christian. Uh, it's anti-capitalist. Um, it destroys private property, uh, governs everything according to central control. It's anti-constitutional. Most of the other countries have been moving towards constitutional governments. It very quickly evolves into a very centralized, what we call totalitarian regime with a despot at the top who controls the entire society, who runs it by terror, if need be, and often it was, in his opinion, needed. Uh, and it aims at conquering the rest of Europe. Nothing like this had happened except at the time of the French Revolution, and that didn't last very long. Uh, by the time Napoleon takes over the reins of France, even though the wars continue, France, Napoleon certainly, has already pretty much made his peace with the other great powers of Europe. He's announced he's willing to live alongside them. He's taken the very unrevolutionary title of emperor as his own. He's married the daughter of the Austrian emperor. So he's not the kind of Lenin or Stalin uh, that we get uh, with the advent of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so the Western world is now divided into these two hostile camps. And again, uh, the communists are dynamic. They want to take over the world. They're kind of secular jihadists. Uh, and they have a great state uh, under their control. <coughs> they have some of their poster art about how they're kind of um, attacking the rest of the world. Uh, for Russia itself, uh, it means famine, terror, mass murder, um, Pictures of the of peasant children in the Ukraine starving, peasants uh, shipped off. And these are kulaks, you know, people who are too wealthy as peasants. They're only peasants, but they're prosperous peasants, so they've got to be dispossessed and shipped off to Siberia. And then you see prisoners in a big gulag system. Well, it's 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 a it's a regime of, of really unprecedented internal barbarity, um, and. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a result. It's a result of, of uh, the uh, Great War. Um, 
the mass murder, it's hard to say exactly from all these causes how many people die, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 million uh, in Russia uh, during the 1930s. Um, it then spreads into China, where even more people die. Uh, this is a Western import. Communism is something made up in the West that spreads outside the world. And in China, under Mao, <coughs> probably 50 to 60 million people die. So uh, these are peacetime deaths, not wartime deaths. They are deaths that are inflicted directly and indirectly uh, by the policies of the regime. Um, and uh, they would not have occurred. They're black swan events. They would not have occurred without the Great War. Uh, and of course, there is a reaction against that. Uh, part of the rise of extreme nationalism in Germany and Italy. Italy was one of the victors. Uh, didn't get all it wanted from the settlement and did lose a lot of people in the war. Uh, but it wasn't a defeated state. Uh, Italy, even though it was part of the central uh, powers treaty system, uh, fails to come to the aid of Germany and Austria when the First World War breaks out. And a year later, it actually goes over to the uh, Allies and fights on the side of the Entente. So, um, but, uh, there's, but there's a nationalist reaction there, too. But what I want to show you here, you see the swastika flag. Uh, this is actually a, um, a poster in Lithuania. And it was put together by the German occupiers of Lithuania in order to rally because the Soviet Union had absorbed Lithuania prior to the outbreak uh, of the war between Germany and the Soviet Union in 1941. Uh, it's trying to rally Lithuanians and other people who have been under the Soviet thumb to the Soviet cause. Uh, but it, it, it suggests the extent to which fear of communism and its spread fueled the rise of this kind of extreme nationalism, uh, this racial nationalism, particularly in Germany, uh, in the form of the Nazis. So there is a polarization that takes place. This is a classic pattern in politics. If you get an extreme left, you'll get an extreme right, and vice versa. You get an extreme right, uh, that mobilizes the left. We see some of that actually, not to the same extreme, but we see some of that uh, in American politics. Today. So the rise of Nazism has a lot to do, would probably not have occurred without the Communist Revolution uh, in Russia. And of course, there were various efforts in Germany, communist efforts in Germany, to seize power. That was a real threat at various times. Uh, and, and here you see a German, this is a, a Nazi poster from 1931, so it is uh, prior to uh, the Nazi takeover. It's two year and a half, probably before the Nazi takeover. Uh, but you can see what they're appealing to. And uh, this German uh, in voting for the Nazis uh, is breaking the chains of Versailles, breaking the chains of the humiliating Versailles Treaty. The Germans were humiliating. Um, the German atrocities, uh, the ones that are inflicted by the Germans uh, during the war, when they invade Poland and Russia, uh, the Holocaust and the, the mass killings of, uh, of Poles and Ukrainians as well. Um, I, I've kind of juxtaposed these positions of bodies stacked up. On that side, you see bodies from a concentration camp. On the other side, you see bodies in the trenches. And I think you could make a plausible argument that one of the things that allowed as brutal a regime uh, as the Nazi regime to arise was the experience that a lot of people who became Nazis had had with the brutality of the First World War, the trench warfare, where death, they were simply habituated to death uh, and to savage slaughter. Uh, it didn't seem as extreme to them uh, as it seems to us. I wouldn't say that's the central explanation, but I think it's a contributing factor. So in the West, among the democracies, of course, Hitler has a long run uh, before the West finally stands up to him. Uh, here you can see his pattern of aggression. The Great War begins with a single assassination. One guy's death uh, is enough to start the Great War. But before the democracies are prepared to stand up to Hitler, he is able to do all sorts of things uh, under the Treaty of Versailles. 
Western Germany, the Rhineland, was supposed to be demilitarized. But in 1936, he sends forces in, German army forces. Uh, they could have easily been turned back by the British and the French, but the British and the French do nothing. Um, in 1938, uh, he takes over Austria. He just marches in and takes the whole country and unites it to Germany. Uh, you know, the British and French worry about this, but they don't do it. Then he starts threatening Czechoslovakia uh, in 1939. And what happens? The British and the French actually give him those portions of Czechoslovakia that had large German uh, populations, the so-called Sudetenland on the borders of Germany. And then, a few months later, he takes the rest. He simply marches in. So, and, and again, uh, now, now the, the British and the French are pretty concerned, but they don't go to war over that. So you can see the difference between the psychology in the democratic West uh, of, at the time of the Great War, you know, the spark is lit and the thing blows up, and in this case, there's huge provocation, outright invasions of neighboring countries. And nothing is done until uh, he turns to Poland. And that's finally the last straw. Then uh, the British and French do go to war. But it takes a long time. And of course, the symbol of not going to war, uh, the appeasement policy, this is Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, uh, in 1938, coming back from a meeting uh, at Munich. Uh, Munich is often referred to, Chamberlain, symbols for appeasement. He comes back and says, we have an agreement with Herr Hitler. Uh, we're going to let him take this part of Czechoslovakia. It means peace in our time. Um, uh, but of course, uh, that time lasted uh, about a year. So uh, it was just buying a little bit of time, that really uh, unlike what Chamberlain hoped. really didn't solve anything. Um, and uh, there's a famous uh, debate that takes place at Oxford among the students. There's an Oxford debating union uh, in which they actually pass a resolution saying, we will not fight for king and country. So the, the, the most prestigious place where the British elites are being trained uh, debates and passes a resolution suggesting they're not going to fight for any reason. Again, a product of what happened during the Great War. Anti-colonialism, again, partly due to the self-determination clause, uh, but also partly to the fact that World War I weakens European confidence. They no longer feel quite as superior as they did before. Uh, uh, at the end of the war, everybody, all adults pretty much, are given the vote. Uh, this shifts the political dynamic in most European countries to the left. They're, generally speaking, more anti-colonial than the right. Uh, so that also pushes for toward the decolonization, which will occur after the Second World War much more uh, than after the first, but it's underway because of the first. Um, a lot of colonials, uh, a lot of Africans and Indians fight in the First World War, uh, people from, from uh, Indochina as well, uh, and having fought, they feel that they should get something back, uh, another ingredient in the anti-colonial mix. The Bolsheviks uh, make a lot of their own anti-colonialism. They want to liberate the people of the world. But that propaganda has some effect. Uh, the 14 points do. Um, some of these things I've mentioned before. You get people like Mohandas Gandhi in the 1920s and 30s taking over leadership of the Indian independence movement and putting the British on the defensive. On the other hand, Japanese imperialism accelerates. And you have democratization uh, in and of itself. The monarchies of Eastern Europe disappear. They're replaced by republics. And most of these republics start off as democracies, though many of them quickly become dictatorships. Um, during the war itself, in Britain, for example, in the trenches, aristocrats and middle class people mix with working class people. There was a lot of class division in Britain. That's partly overcome by the experience of the war. Women's suffrage. Women have played an important part in the war effort. So women's suffrage also is a big push after the war is over and occurs pretty quickly uh, following the war. Uh, those men who did not have the right to vote are given it uh, very quickly. And in the United States, the Great Migration, uh, African Americans moving from the South to the North during the war, as well as fighting, of course. Uh, but their movement uh, up to Northern cities uh, where um, voting restrictions 
uh, didn't exist or were much weaker, they began to have much more political impact. So the foundation of the American Civil Rights Movement uh, is laid. So all these are democratizing events. There are economic effects too. Uh, during the war itself, uh, there's an awful lot of planning. Uh, the governments take over uh, their economies and run them, push them towards maximum military production. Uh, that will create a model for what happens later in the 20th century as government gets bigger and bigger. When the New Deal occurs in the United States, the pattern for government regulation of the economy in the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s is very close to the pattern of Woodrow Wilson taking over the economy when the United States goes to war uh, in 1917. You also have the rise of Keynesianism, which is a, not a socialist philosophy, but a, a philosophy of government intervention in the economy. A lot of wealth is transferred to the United States because the United States financially bails out Europe during the war. And uh, you get tariff wars, trade wars occurring uh, after the end of the war. Um, maybe a little like today, too, uh, in which free trade and, and a universal gold standard uh, are, are taken off the table. There are innovations in warfare that grow out of the First World War. We still have them today. Development of air, air warfare, that of course is for the first time <coughs> in the Great War. Uh, when the war is over in Britain, politicians are of the belief that it's impossible to stop bombers uh, and bombing of great cities if war breaks out. This is part of the fear that leads to appeasement. The bombers will always get through. It said uh, the establishment of machine guns and heavy artillery, uh, they're now the backbone of land warfare. Uh, the reason that the casualties are so great is primarily because of machine guns and heavy artillery. You have the development of tank warfare, uh, the end of cavalry. Horses are no longer going to be used in any real way in future wars. Submarines come into existence as a tool uh, of naval warfare. Uh, poison gas, it's outlawed. Um, mass conscription, expansion of battlefronts, the whole notion of a world war. Uh, the world, Great War is, is much less of a world war than people think. It's fought mainly in Europe, both in the East and the West. It's fought to a significant extent in the Middle East, in what is today Syria, Israel, Iraq, and Turkey. Uh, and it's fought to a degree in Africa. Uh, but very little takes place in Asia. Um, so it's not a world war in the same sense that the Second World War is. One can almost argue that the Seven Years' War, which you may have heard of from 1763 to 1756 to 1763, was more of a world war uh, because it was fought in India, the Americas, and Europe simultaneously than the Great War was. But the term world war comes into existence following uh, the Great War, following the Second World War. <clears throat> so in conclusion, 20th century is normally thought of as beginning in 1914 and ending in 1989 uh, with the end of the Cold War. Um, and that's because the Great War creates communism, the Great War creates Nazism, all the conflicts that will continue until nearly the end of the century uh, arise out of it. Um, it sets in motion the events that will lead to the Second World War and Cold War. A cultural revolution kind of occurs afterwards. People who want to get away from the grimness of the bloodshed and the, 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 the endless uh, slaughters on the battlefields. You have the Roaring Twenties and the relaxation of, of sexual morals and beginnings of feminism in many ways. Uh, notion of progress is cast into doubt. Uh, people increasingly are inclined to think that people are irrational or intellectuals are increasingly inclined to think the world is based on irrational uh, actions. You have the growth of Freudian psychology uh, and economic instability due to a lot of the planning uh, that has started in the First World War is now carried over into civilian life and largely makes things worse. It's probably uh, true that the Great Depression lasts as long as it does, not because every time you have a stock market crash, you're going to have a great depression, but rather because of the inept reactions to it by the government that prevent uh, the economy from recovering faster than it otherwise. So, uh, 
that's the story of the Great War and its impact today. Um, any questions? Do you think the success of uh, All Quiet on the Western Front in America has to do with John Boy Walton? <laughs> I mean, I remember seeing him, and he is one of the main characters. In, you know, that, in All Quiet on the Western Front? Yeah. Are you thinking of Sergeant Ewell? I don't think he's the young tribe phase guy that gets shot in the very end. You know, he drew pictures. I think you're thinking of a different one. That's the, it's it's the newer version. Oh, it's the newer version? It's the yeah. color version. The yeah. color version. So who was, uh, this sounds like an American character. It was probably. It, yeah. How, how does he, how but does it was German, I mean. He, but it, really? Yeah, it was made in what, 76, so, 72, 76? So in the version I saw, you know, the hero. I saw the black and white. Right. Oh, okay. The, the hero, his name is Paul. Yeah. And he's killed at the very end yeah. because he wants to Snap reach out and get a Butterfly. Yes. He reaches over the parapet and gets killed by a sniper. And I might tell you, apropos that, that I am here today because of that, because when my parents, who were still engaged, saw that movie and my father shed a tear, my mother said, That's the kind of guy I want to marry. He has a heart. <laughs> so you wouldn't have got this lecture were it not for the ending of the whole question. Somebody else would. That's a great movie. It's a great movie. I, I owe a lot to it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for being here.